Conditions that respond to dietary change, um, most of them, most of them that are chronic and degenerative. And this came up in one of the talks yesterday. You know, if you're in a car accident and you have a broken leg, reading the China study and eating a baked potato is not going to fix your problem. But if you have, if you have acne, if you have, if you have arthritis and chronic sinus infections and, and uh, kidney stones and, and neuropathy and all the chronic degenerative conditions that really constitute most of what our healthcare bills um, are for, uh, you're going to see you're going to see a difference based on diet, both in incidence rate and also uh, in the ability to stop the progression of and even reverse. Now, let's talk about diabetes first, and I'll, I'll share some information with you. Again, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this because the diabetes rate in this country is so high, and it's increasing in other countries too. The last time I looked, the diabetes, the number of diabetics in Shanghai, China, was 1.2 million. Can you imagine having over a million diabetics in one city? Of course, it's a big city with a big population, but if the Chinese population continues to experience this growing disease rate, they're not, they have no capacity financially to deal with this. This is a problem that doesn't just affect us, it affects people all over the world. So the standard American diet, you guys know, it's comprised of calorie-dense animal foods, high in fat, weight gain increases the risk of type 2 diabetes, and one way to gain weight is to eat calorie-dense, high-fat food. Another thing is animal foods contain heme iron, and a lot of people don't realize this, but higher heme iron levels um, increase insulin resistance. Um, higher intake of heme iron. So that's one of the ways that people think that the problem is potatoes. I gotta tell you something, the problem's not potatoes for diabetes, the problem is steak, the problem is cheese. That's what's going to um, increase your, your risk of diabetes, but particularly red meat and the high heme iron content. Um, a study comparing a relationship between insulin uh, resistance um, and iron intake, the lacto-ovo vegetarians showed um, I showed vegetarians are more insulin sensitive uh, than um, lacto-ovo vegetarians and meat eaters. And you see this, uh, again, you can look at a map of the world and see where people are eating a plant-based diet. You see low incidence of type 2 diabetes. Uh, eating a meat-based diet, you see a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. Um, now, let's talk about type 1 diabetes for a minute. Um, and the type 1 diabetes, one of the causes of it is related to something called molecular mimicry. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, but molecular mimicry means that the amino acid chains that make up one, one protein resemble the amino acid chains that make up another protein. And um, so if you take a look at, um, uh, at, at these food proteins, for example, I'm going to show you how this happens. Partially digested food proteins get into the bloodstream. The body does exactly what it's supposed to do creates antibodies to those food proteins. And then um, if there are proteins in the body, tissues in the body, where the amino acid chains that make up those tissues look similar, those antibodies will go after those body parts. It's the body attacking itself by, with its own immune system. So how this happens in some children is cow's milk is designed to help a baby cow grow into a full-grown cow in a pretty short period of time. It was never designed for human intake. Some kids don't digest milk very well. We all don't digest it very well after weaning, but some kids, little kids, don't digest milk well. And another confounding factor is a condition called leaky gut, which a lot of children have because they are treated with antibiotics so much um, due to ear infections and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, children develop a leaky gut as the beneficial bacteria in their guts is uh, killed off as a result of the antibiotics. And uh, so these partially digested milk uh, proteins get into the bloodstream, the body creates antibodies to uh, attack those, um, those foreign invaders. And these, for these little fragments of uh, milk protein, the amino acid chains look a lot like the amino acid chains that make up the beta cells that produce insulin in the pancreas. And the antibodies begin attacking those beta cells, and if enough of them are killed off, you end up with a type 1 diabetic. Now, how do we know that this is true? Well, in 1992, um, a study was done where blood samples were taken from children who have had type 1 diabetes and children who didn't. 
and what they found is 100% of the children with type 1 diabetes had antibodies to cow's milk proteins, and none of the children in the control group without diabetes had those antibodies. And several studies have confirmed that. I've listed three of them here. Uh, so we get a pretty consistent result. Now, this doesn't mean, obviously, that all children who consume cow's milk develop type 1 diabetes, but their risk is higher. In fact, one study showed that genetically susceptible children who consume cow's milk have an 11.3 times greater risk of developing juvenile diabetes, and that's higher than the risk that a smoker will develop lung cancer. Now, we said this before. We spent a lot of money um, teaching people, trying to prevent people from smoking, trying to get them to quit if they've already taken up the habit, and I think that's a very good idea. Smoking is not good for your health. And then we spend a lot of money promoting cow's milk intake in this country, which leads to just as many problems of a different sort, but just as many problems. And guess who pays the bill for this? The taxpayers are burdened with a lot of the cost of this. So our public policies are almost incoherent as it pertains to health in this country.